Did you know that one of the most common misconceptions of children who fear the doctors is that they believe they're being sent to the doctors to get a poke or a shot because they've been bad. Today, I'm meeting with Lauren, who's a child life specialist of Mommy's Little Helper to help dispel those common myths and misconceptions. She will also give us tips on how to best support and advocate not only for our children, but for ourselves and other caregivers when our children are at the doctors or being hospitalized. So they think because like I'm at the hospital because I was mean to sister or bad. I'm Lauren. I am a certified child life specialist based out of Cleveland, Ohio. I'm also the founder of Mommy's Little Helper. So I support families all over the country. So basically a certified child life specialist is just someone that supports families through medical encounters, illness, disability. So oftentimes you'll find child life specialists in the hospital setting, but they can also own a private practice. You could find them outpatient. You could find them sometimes at pediatric dental offices, children's bereavement camps. So you can work in like a variety of settings, but traditional child life is in the hospital setting. I feel like we could use them in so many other settings, like urgent care. For example, when I worked in yes. urgent care, we have to wrap those babies in burritos. And my kiddo just got wrapped in a burrito blanket for oh. a strap test the other day. And I was thinking, I'm like, could ask. That would be really weird. And they're going to look at me like I'm crazy because it was a hospital urgent care. But um, yeah, and I haven't taken my kids to the dentist yet either because it's too hard and they won't do it. So gosh, we, we need more child life. No, specialists. you're spot on. There's a huge, huge gap. And that was honestly like the reason I started Mommy's Little Helper is because at most doctor's offices going to take your child for like their physical immunizations, whatever, like mm -hmm. sick, they oftentimes don't have child life. And the nurses there oftentimes don't have training from child life specialists. Like sometimes you'll get lucky and you'll find oh these professionals have had specific training from a child specialist coming into the doctor's office and telling them about it but most times like they don't have that so nurses don't know they're just so used to okay you hold the kid down you burrito wrap them this is what we've always done this is what how you do it this is how you get a kid to cooperate and they don't know it's another way so i don't i love nurses i don't blame them but i genuinely think it's a lack of education and Mommy's Little Helper was specifically designed to help parents know how to help their kid in that situation. Because like, if there's no child life present, the question becomes, how do I help my kid through the situation? How do I make it less traumatic? Because that's that's the ultimate goal is like to avoid trauma, which can be, you know, it can last for so long, even though it's a little thing. It can last for forever. You could still have medical anxiety as an adult. It can be so a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of grown adults think that. I mean, so I guess that's a reason why it's important to have a child life specialist present. Can you go into a little bit of detail about that? Like, why do we need it? What is the trauma that can be caused? Like, what are the results? What have you seen in kids, especially kids who have medical problems and have to go to the doctors regularly? Like, what's your experience there if they don't have a child life specialist or support or the parents not informed? Yes, absolutely. So I mean, it can vary. Taking your child to just their regular doctor's appointment, that can be traumatizing alone. And you can see kids having severe anxiety with future appointments just because they weren't prepped properly. They were traumatized with some kind of procedure and it was just terrible. They had no child life support. But also when it comes to like inpatient hospitalization, if they're not getting a child life specialist, honestly, what you see all the time is huge misconceptions. So like mm -hmm. as a child life specialist, I'm specifically trained to assess when there's misconceptions the child might have. So one way to assess this as a parent is you can do what's called medical play. So you get out like a baby doll stuffed animal, you play out the situation, like a medical play kit, you'll play out the situation and see what kids say. So I've had kids all the time be like the, the baby or stuffed animal is being bad. So they're going to get hurt. They're going to get a shot. They're going to get poked. So they think because oh. I like I'm at the hospital because I was mean to sister or bad. I think bad. it's a huge misconception. So when child life isn't there, parents just think I'm supporting my kid the best they can because parents they're doing the best they can, honestly. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't realize their child has this misconception. So I think it's so important when child life is able to be present or if parents are able to learn some strategies to better assess their child or support them, it makes a huge, huge difference. Because a child for a year getting cancer treatment thinking, this is my fault, I did something that caused this, versus like 
my body's sick and not feeling good. There's nothing I did to cause this. But because of that, I have to get those pokes or those ouchies, whatever, the chemo mm -hmm. treatment, uh, which isn't fun, but it's to make my body better. So yeah. it can just make a huge, huge difference. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to go a step further because I have this unique experience and a lot of people have it. A mom of two little ones and healthcare provider and worked in PEDS before and, and see plenty, plenty of PEDS patients. Um, so I feel like as healthcare providers, we're not really trained ever or well-versed in this. I mean, we can have yeah. empathy, sympathy, but we also are not trained in how to talk to kids. So if it's left up to the doctor, the nurse, the PA, the NP, the healthcare provider, we might not be informed enough. We might not know what to do. And I can think of so many times that before I really looked into this for my own kids, maybe I didn't say the right thing or maybe I went too fast and didn't give them time to understand. So do you guys ever sort of help educate healthcare providers too. Absolutely. So a lot of children's hospitals, um, particularly ones I've been at, you have like a training. So typically when like the staff will get an orientation, then the child life has like an hour or so to train staff on different things involving children and how to work with children in different capacities and to consult child life if you can. But yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a huge gap there and it's not medical staff's fault. They're put in these situations and they don't, they're not trained. They're trained. I give the kid this treatment when this happens. They're not trained. Okay. This prevents this trauma. They're not trained in how to specifically make it a little easier for the child. And I, I'm a huge fan of nurses. I'm a huge fan of doctors, but oftentimes they don't know what to say or how to handle situations. Mm -hmm. so absolutely. Training them. I think we could obviously improve in this area because there's such a gap, but little by little, I'm hoping that it becomes a better environment for medical staff to know how to help kids through these situations. Absolutely. And it's such a good outlet for you to be on social media, too, because uh, as healthcare providers, we're all consuming. We're on TikTok. We're on Instagram. And we can learn in those seconds. Like, Do we have time for classes? And I don't know. But it's so easy to understand that, especially when you're a parent and it starts to matter to you and you can see both sides of it. it seems Absolutely. Really beneficial. Now, I'm imagining you've had pushback because we know in healthcare, we've got to see more patients in a shorter time. And this is just yeah. going in this country. And I'm thinking as something as simple as putting a nebulizer on a check, which could be terrifying. They scream and scream. And as a healthcare provider, we're always told ah, they're getting the medicine. If they're screaming, it's fine. And that's awful, right? And now thinking about that being my own kid, I can't, in the ER, it's so rushed, it's so hurried. So how do you push back enough to get the time when the child and the parents over at the same time and let the kid get the right treatment? Like, that's a big job. <laughs> that is a very big job. Yeah. I think there's several aspects with it. So one, when child life is present, like, we are specifically there to advocate for children's needs. So like, mm -hmm. I've had situations where like the resident didn't wait for mm -hmm. the child to get the, their pain medicine to kick in. And the parent doesn't know. They're just told, okay, this is what's happening. But so I've specifically like I make a point to ask the nurse what medicine they took, how long, how much longer till it kicks in. And then I can go in the room and advocate, okay, I heard there's five more minutes. We're starting the procedure in five minutes. The doctor can give me a dirty look. Like, my job is to prioritize the family. Because yeah. the family, the mom doesn't, the mom or dad doesn't know. The, but they don't have a voice. They need someone to advocate for them. So when child life is able to be present, we're able to try and prevent some of this trauma. But when child life isn't, it's honestly it becomes a question as a parent of what do I advocate for? Sometimes parents, they want to support their kids so bad, but they don't know what they can and can't advocate for what's appropriate. What do I even ask? You know, it's so hard to know. So I think equipping parents with the right questions to ask the staff is yes. huge. And then also the component of helping the medical staff understand this is how a child thinking, this is how their brain works, like helping them know, okay, you can do this to prevent trauma is it's a huge thing. Absolutely. Well, and even more, like now that I'm working in mental health, I have a little bit more of a sense of what repetitive trauma does to the brain, even at a young age. And I think it's in our nature as maybe healthcare providers or people who don't have children to say they're super young, their memory's not formed, they're not going to remember it. Let's just they won't remember it. Just get it done. So, yeah. what does that trauma do? Like, what have I mean? What do you see? And we've talked about the fear, and we've talked about the self blame, but like. Can we go further with that? Like, what does that look like in an adolescent who's had to deal with sickness? Yeah, no, that's a great question. It, honestly, it can make such a big impact from like 
Yes, children, even in the NICU, people think like, oh, the baby, the infant won't remember. The amount of times, like I, when I did the, or that, a nurse would be like, you, they don't need child life. It's fine. They won't remember it. It's super, super common misconception. Although, yeah, you're, you're spot on. The baby won't remember it as an adolescent. But it can make a huge impact on their development, which transfers to them coping as an adolescent and medical anxiety and all that. It really plays a big role. Mental trauma as a buildup can cause things like anxiety and depression in adolescence, yes. which we all know right now is sort of an epidemic with things like self-harm and, you know, worse than that. So yeah. I think everything we can do as parents to kind of prevent that trauma even in a situation where the child's sick. Absolutely. And I don't know if you know my background or my story, but I was the child that was traumatized in medical encounters. I would. No, let's hear it. So my mom was a peds nurse. Yeah. Um, she was actually a pediatric nurse. So she was trained on help, like getting kids through a procedure in the sense of like getting it done. Yeah. It's traditional. We just have to get it done no matter what it takes. Mm-hmm. I was the kid that took four nurses to hold me down. <laughs> I was that child. I was very strong-willed. I was terrified of medical encounters. I was a NICU baby and, oh. and had those kind of procedures. But then all the way through a typical doctor's appointment, taking me to the doctor was very different than taking like your average kid to the doctor. I would, oh my gosh, my mom was, my poor mom was so embarrassed. But I still have medical anxiety as an adult. Yeah. Um. Honestly, it can, and like sometimes it's less about, Pain management's a huge thing, but sometimes for kids, it's less about just like that poke that hurts so bad as much as it is the anxiety and the trauma surrounding it. I was held down against, yeah, I was held down against my will by four people that like, I don't know what they're trying to do to me and why why am I getting poked? Is it something I did wrong? Like no one explained to me, no one prepped me for this. No one explained you're going to get this medicine to make you feel better or whatever the poke is for, you know? So Again, huge misconceptions around that. And I just think... Go ahead. No, no, you go. You're good. This is it's funny because now that you're talking about it, I'm like thinking back to my childhood and my doctor's appointments and I remember it. I had a doctor and I had ear infections so much. And unfortunately, I passed that to my kids. But I had tubes multiple times and I always had to get my ears checked. We had this old male doctor and he would pull, serious pull and hold you down. I still remember the pain to this day. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned that. And I'm so sensitive to my ears now on airplanes and everything else because I still have issues. And then, like, I'm thinking back, I had to have a little surgery for a remol- mole removal on my back in, like, first grade. And I remember very vividly my mom was on her bed. We were sitting next to her bed, and she told me I was going to have to have surgery. And I remember how she presented it. And she did a really good job saying, we're going to be here for, me, for you. You know, you can bring your stuffed animal. Everything's going to be fine. You're going to feel fine the next day. Not everything's going to be fine, but, like, yeah, it's going to hurt. And, you know, afterwards, you'll, you'll feel okay and you'll have a bandage. And she kind of went through it. And then I went through this procedure where you're getting numbed with lidocaine. Do you remember it? I was in such a vivid memory of that. So let's think about the kids who have had long-term treatment or cancers. They're going to remember it as adults. Yeah. And it yeah. doesn't leave you. It's funny because there's a lot of things I don't remember. But like, gosh, now that you said that, I can picture myself in that doctor's office with the, the male doctor who would pull my ears every time. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah, we remember the traumas. Honestly, it can even into adolescence and adulthood, the traumas can make such an impact. And it may oh. seem like no big deal to an adult. Oh, you just got a shot at the doctor's office. You just got a blood draw. But being held down for no reason and like you don't know why it's or like it's new. It's traumatizing. You know? What do you do with the kid who's like, I mean, obviously, we don't like strep swabs, right? So what do you do with a kid who needs that procedure? And you've talked with them and you've kind of explained, you know, this is because our body gets sick sometimes. And I don't know even what you say. You might be better at telling me. But what about the kid who's still resistant? And it's still going to be a little traumatic for them. Like, then. Yeah, so honestly, sometimes it's going to be a little traumatic. And there's nothing we can do to reduce the entire bit of trauma. But there's little things we can do to make it better. So first of all, depending on the age, before any of this happens, I want to do some medical play with that kid. Prep them. Like you said, explain it in developmentally appropriate language so they understand. But let's say at home I use, I don't know, a Q-tip or something, and I show on their stuffed animal what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Have them have some control over the situation. They can play it out, too. Like, I'll have them lead some of the play. So give back that sense of control. Help them to understand what's going to happen. So they're prepped. They know a little bit about what to expect. Now, at the doctor's appointment, oftentimes, if you have, like, a coping plan in place, 
it, mm -hmm. it can make a huge difference. So for instance, you tell them what's going to happen. They don't really have a choice in that, but you can say during that, would you like mommy to sing a song to you? Or would you like me to play a video on the iPad? Like depending on the procedure and things yeah. like it can make a huge difference because they have a sense of control. They're getting to choose what they do during it. And you have a plan in place of, okay, while this procedure takes place, you're going to do this. So they have like a job. They have something they can do. You can say like, your job is to stay super still like a statue. You can practice with that preparation. Um, you can practice like things like a comfort hold, um, which I've shared a little bit in my other videos. But basically comfort positions are just a way to hold your child to keep them safe and still during procedures. Mm -hmm. So for an instance, at a doctor's appointment, oftentimes medical staff aren't familiar with these just because they're not trained in these. So the best way to go about it is if you look up comfort holds and you take a picture of a comfort hold, show the nurse on your phone, I want to try this. They're a little less resistant. The okay. child is sitting on your lap with their legs around your waist, their chest to your yeah. chest, and you're like, you can do chest their arms in their head. That's, mm -hmm. that's all. Yeah, that's a great example. So holding them still and safe, that makes it less traumatic because procedures based on research, it's less traumatic to have a kid sitting up than oh, laying down for sound. I mean, think about it as an adult. Same thing. Yeah. So I can see so much of what you're saying, even if you have child life at the hospital, it's still going to fall on the parents. That preparation, and my kids always yeah. more. We have to prep him for a lot of stuff weeks in advance. You know, he's going up to pre-K in two weeks and we're talking about it every day. I so love that. Imagery. And he's always been like that. And he'll wake up and be like, well, what's planned for today? What's today? And what's tomorrow? And we talk about it, but with medical stuff that got their flu shots. And we sort of prepped that um, beforehand. And it's tricky, though, because you can't do it too far in advance because then they hyper focus on it. Yes, yeah. or exactly. When should we bring it up? Should it be the day before, the day of? I mean, you, I guess you got to judge based on your child. But. You're exactly right. You want to base it like every child's a little different. Every child copes differently. So also like another thing is there's active copers. There's avoidant copers. So you want to know your child. Some kids want to know all the details. They'll ask all the questions. They want to know everything about the procedure. When you do a blood draw, the active copers, they want me to walk them through. Okay, first we're tying a tight rubber band around your arm. I call a tourniquet a tight rubber band. Yeah. Um, so I will walk them through every detail. Then there's like avoidant copers. So they're the kids that want to watch a video on the iPad, be distracted yeah. during the procedure. So it's really knowing your child. And as a parent, you know your child best. So honestly, helping parents gain the confidence to know, I know my child best. We have this coping plan in place. Like we're going to try and do this. And let's say the coping plan doesn't go according to plan. The kid start, your kid starts freaking out during it, even though you had this perfect plan in place. Mm -hmm. I, cha I challenge parents all the time. Take a deep breath. Calm yourself. Because kids can tell if you're anxious, they're going to ask for more. So well, calm yourself. Part of it. You just have to learn too. Just like, and that's part of your role too is, these parents probably have trauma too. And they're probably, really, especially if their kids in the ER. So, so what do we have to do as parents? Yeah. So prepping yourself as a parent, like knowing, okay, I'm going to tell my, myself this mantra. I always, I love mantras. I'm telling myself, no matter what, I know my child best and it's going to be okay. Calming yourself, taking a deep breath, telling yourself a mantra you have prepared before that appointment. So no matter how it goes, you're able to stay calm for your kid. It's huge. A number like B is honestly, adapting the plan, being able to take a deep breath, calm yourself. And okay, the video or the, the song we're singing together isn't working. I'm going to adapt it. Let's try a video on the iPad. I'm going to adapt this. Let me try just singing. Let me try, you know, trying different things and telling yourself after it happens, no matter what, I'm not a fail failure as a parent. Parents yeah. think all the time, if my child freaks out during this procedure it means i'm a bad mom it means i'm a bad dad and reminding yourself no matter how your child copes you're you're there to support them and you are a good mom no matter how they cope you're still a good mom and i think that's a huge component of it and honestly an another big misconception is parents think when my kid cries that means they're not coping that means i'm failing as a parent but when you think about it a a child crying to a painful procedure or something scary and new and something they're not familiar with is a developmentally appropriate response. Yeah. When you're scared of this as an adult, it's okay to cry. It's appropriate. So instead of telling your kid and you're getting more worked up as a parent because your kid's crying, telling them it's okay to be a little nervous. It's okay to cry. Yeah. Out of scared and that's a appropriate response. So once again, your kid crying, your kid not coping well, you're still a good parent. You know, I think that's a good thing. 
Well, and okay. as parents, I think there's a lot of sense of like um, shame, right? And we always want our kids to do the appropriate thing when they're at the doctors and half the time they're sick. So maybe we're not yes. empathizing with how they're actually feeling. And we're just wanting to, you know, show that we have it all in control and our kids are not going to bother you, doctor. I know you're busy, yeah. but um, that's not really the case. And a lot of pediatricians won't expect that either. They kind of know, hey, this is okay. And that's a, a healthy release of emotions when they cry. But I think as parents, we feel so guilty. We're apologetic. And then we feel shy, yeah. which the child can feel. They can tell. That is spot on. When you when you tell that doctor, I'm so sorry, my kid's crying. Oh, they You're they're listening. You're you they absolutely spot on. They're listening. Yeah, yeah. and that's such a that's such a good point. Wow, Ugh. it's hard. Um, let's talk about how we as parents need to learn about this. And this information isn't really readily available. There's a lot of stuff about gentle parenting. Yeah, it's not a lot of information or guidance on how to handle these traumatic situations, scary situations when your child is sick or you have a bad diagnosis for your child. And so you've created a program to help yeah. parents learn. And let's go a little bit more into that. Tell me the details about that, what they're going to learn from you, how they're going to benefit, how you're going to be there to support, because it's it's really obvious based on what we've been talking about that they need education. We all need the education somehow. So, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, with Mommy's Little Helper, um, I provide all my videos like on Instagram, YouTube, all my like free content, but I also have a coaching program. So, you can get anything from I just need 45 minutes with a child eye specialist because there's it's it's hard to have access to a child eye specialist. We're not just, you know, so I just need time with a child eye specialist to learn how to help my child through. The last week's appointment went horrible. I just need some time with you to figure out how to help my child for the future. Or you can do anything. I have free programs. So you can do the most, like, has everything included, the VIP program. You can literally have me, like, one-on-one -on -one for two months periods. You can text me, call me, anything you need. I am there for you. Yeah, and that is typically the parents that want that one are, it's not just, like, a one experience. I just need some tips. It's like the, I need support for myself. My child's not coping, whether it's, medical related, whether it's stressful situations or it's just like being a parent is freaking hard. Like I I need support for myself. And as a child specialist, yes, we are support for the kids, but also I've provided just as much the parent support for parents. So having that person there, like a child eye specialist just for you to support you through whatever you're going through as a parent, or you need just parenting strategies in general. Your child's having a hard time with transitions. Your child's having a hard time with the loss of a loved one, no matter what it is, like we specialize in child development, supporting parents. So basically my coaching program is designed to help parents no matter where you're at. I, I meet parents where they're at with their specific concerns to help their child through difficult situations and to help them with parenting because it's like I said, it's hard. Absolutely. It's funny because you said mantras and I can remember the last time really using a mantra was when I sleep trained. And that just hugs on your heart. As infants, we did sleep training for both my kids. Uh, my mm -hmm. first one was five months old and he was in a helmet. And that was my first experience, right? It's your first kid. And I did the whole taking care of babies thing. And I did mm -hmm. the mantras and I use them now all the time. Not the same mantra. Yeah. This is what's best for me as a mom or for my family or for my child. And everyone's going to be okay no matter how hard it is. Whether you're in the midst of a, a tantrum or a sickness or anything. So to take that back a little, we know we use child life specialists before surgery and in the hospitals, but you're saying that your program helps in all ways, whether you have a behavioral thing, a parent who's stressed or maybe doesn't have support or that village that we all look for, mm -hmm. or a child who tantrums and they all do, right? And so just kind of, you're going to guide parents through all things, not just medical things. Absolutely. And I think a big thing with parents is a lot of parents, they they know how to support their kid, but they lack the confidence to do it. They they feel like they don't know what they're doing. And my part of my program, a part of my job is to really help parents gain confidence and feel like, you know what, I can I can tackle whatever situation. Their child is having a tantrum, very triggering, or they're at a doctor's appointment, very triggering to a parent because they have their own trauma like we talked about, or it's just they don't know what to do and they feel stuck. 
Mm -hmm. They want to help parents feel equipped to handle whatever situation their child is throwing at you or at them, you know? Yeah, it's so important. There's so many sort of big brands that are on TikTok, social media, um, you know, psychiatry sort of ways, but you can't get access to them in the way that your program would Mm -hmm. allow parents to access you and have that support. So that is so awesome. I love that because our whole goal is to decrease trauma in childhood and allow to mm-hmm. adolescents to develop better and have less anxiety, less depression, and therefore yeah. be able to be the parent to their child one day. You know, it doesn't have to deal with sort of all that baggage that comes along with with life. Absolutely. And I think I, with my programs, I teach parents to look at parenting a little different. So an example is like um, I had a mom that was basically she thought her child wasn't coping with a medical mm-hmm. encounter. And what we talked about is the specific things I assess as a child eye specialist with regards to child coping after a medical encounter is I'm looking for two things. I want to see, one, how long does it take for them to return to baseline? Mm-hmm. So parents, for instance, like in the ER, your child has a procedure. They're thinking, oh, my gosh, my child's crying. I don't know what to help. Watch how long it takes to your child to return to baseline. Mm-hmm. With support, are you able to make shushing noises? If they're an infant, are you able to sing a song? Are you able to hold them and try and calm them? Are they able to return to baseline? That's one. Mm-hmm. Number two, if it's like a toddler, for instance, you want to look at how is that child able to engage in play? Children cope through play. They learn through mm-hmm. play. That They speak the ling- their language is play. So mm-hmm. when a child is able to engage in play after some kind of traumatic event, after a tantrum, after a medical procedure, that shows they're coping. So mm-hmm. I think part of my goal in my specific program is to help parents think about coping and think about their child and and understand it in a different way where they're not feeling like they're failing at parenting. They feel like, oh, my child's doing this. That means they're coping or that means this and I can help them in this way. So equipping them with the tools and the confidence to handle basically just different tough situations. Well, in sort of understanding from an external source that this is developmentally normal and appropriate. Mm-hmm. Tantrums are normal. Yeah. And having that outside reassurance that's not a spouse and not a mom or a dad or an in-law, it's like really helpful. It's really powerful, I think. So absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm wondering if there's any like really good stories that you have. And I know that you're doing something a little bit different now in the hospital than you were before. So I definitely want to dive into that because end of life is like, it's mind blowing to me. I've had to leave Positions as a PA because I don't cope well with that. Mm -hmm. And so people who do are just amazing and incredible to me. And and the fact that I think you're doing some stuff with end of life childhood or in a parent. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's such a heavy load. So tell us a little bit about that, what you're doing. So basically my position now, I support families through end of life. So that could mean the children losing a parent or that could mean parents losing a child which both are really really difficult situations and unique and and have grief in their own ways they're very different so one thing i look at is like children's understanding of grief is very different than adults Mm -hmm. so for instance adults understand the finality of death they understand okay that means this person isn't coming back Mm -hmm. a toddler not so much they think okay you told me they died but will i see them tomorrow they they don't understand the finality of death. Mm-hmm. So I basically work on equipping parents with the tools where they understand their child's understanding of death. They understand how to support them during death and through the process of grief. And also I help parents address any misconceptions the child may have. So mm-hmm. for instance, a lot of parents um, will use the term like, Oh, they're the loved one like passed away or they're I've heard like sleeping relations. Mm -hmm. And I highly recommend using the terms death and dying because otherwise Mm -hmm. that's confusing for a child. They think, oh, they they went to sleep and they'll be back like they they tend to their their imaginations kind of run wild and they tend to have Mm -hmm. misconceptions. So um, there's a few like as far as like tips I have for let's just say a child visiting a sick parent in the hospital. Um, So when a child visits a a sick parent in the hospital, depending on like if it's an ICU, if it's something really intense, I Mm. recommend if there's like a loved one that's supporting the child through this for them to take a picture of their loved one. So Mm -hmm. I know it sounds silly, but having a picture showing the kid at home is actually a way to prep them. You can show them, okay, this is the medical equipment in the room. This is the medicine. They can show them the different things. So then the child doesn't have 
a huge amount of trauma when they go and see that loved one. So you're prepping them. Step two, I really, really recommend giving the child a special job or allowing them to have something that will help them cope. For instance, Mm -hmm. you can ask them, do you want to make a special picture for mom? Mm -hmm. Do you want to read a book together to mom? Do you want Mm -hmm. to bring your favorite stuffed animal? Like Mm -hmm. allowing them appropriate choices, allowing them to have something to turn to when they're at that hospital. So for instance, you could bring like a toy. So if it's too Mm -hmm. much, they can play. Children cope through play. Having something there for them can be super helpful. And just involving them, allowing them to pick out, do you want the pink, put the pink blanket on her or the blue one? Allowing them choices, allowing them to be involved helps them feel like they're contributing and they're able to cope better. Yeah. Well, and I can even imagine that after that visit, they're going to need to replay, replay, replay. And, yes. you know, I read a book, um, The Whole Brain Child, and they talk about coping and playing it like a movie and hitting pause when it's too much and allowing the child to hold that remote and say, well, you know, what just happened? Can you like tell me what we did and what we saw? And they say, yes. you can say pause when you want. And that picture you mm-hmm. talked about would be very useful because it doesn't end when they leave the hospital. And it, yeah. it, I mean, that's another role where parents need support outside of the hospital and they need knowledge. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think like play is a huge way for kids to process. So allowing them when they go home to play it out with you Mm. and listen for misconceptions. If the child is saying like, like they, their loved one is sick and, and going to die. And now because the sibling was with them, we're all going to die. Or th- oh. there's so many misconceptions. So they'll say like, cause I was me to sister, like now they're going to die. That's and, it. The blame. Yeah, playing yep. it out and having them process. So you can identify what those misconceptions are and kind of clarify them. So they better understand what's actually going on. Nothing they did to cause this. I always emphasize this. There's nothing they yeah. did to cause the death, nothing they did to cause their loved one to get sick. It's not contagious. It's not like a cold where you can give it to someone. Their body's sick and either we're working on getting it better or there's nothing we can do, depending on the situation, you know, yeah. keeping it developmentally appropriate, I think is just a huge thing. Well, because I went to work in mental health, I read this study a couple of weeks ago about children, young children of parents who have completed suicide, right? They've passed. And what happens is the family mm-hmm. doesn't talk in real terms to that child, their whole life about it. They kind of avoid, avoid, avoid. And so what happens in a lot of these cases is these children grow up to think it's their fault. And there's a lot of self-blame in childhood, just like you said, with a shot. It's because yeah. I was mean to sister or with a parent being sick. Oh, it's because I got them sick, you know? Like, so in order to avoid that, I think, you know, talking in real terms and learning and understanding how to help your child cope through a death of a parent, loved one, or an illness is, mm-hmm. is important for their future. And I don't think we knew that before or realized it or recognized it. But. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think just like parents, they have so much going on. They're grieving themselves oftentimes, or they have just there's so much they're already trying to cope with. And, and so it's hard for them to remember, oh, the child might have this misconception. They might be thinking this, or they don't know how to explain it to a child. They're trying their best, but they're not getting the support they need. And that was part of the purpose of Mommy's Little Helper. Like, I want to help parents mm-hmm. feel like they they know how to explain things. They know how to handle it. They're getting the support for themselves that they need in, yeah. in order to better care for their child. Because if parents aren't getting support, like, you're not able to provide support for your kids when you're not taking care of yourself. It's just too much, you know? Yep. Yep. Wow. So how do you cope with all this heavy (laughs) stuff? Seeing it. I mean, these are big things. Um, Illness and children. It's like such a hard thing to comprehend for me right now. How do you do that? And then go home and do it again the next day. Like, Mm. I I will say it's difficult, but um, basically when I started my career, I was in the trauma center and I was not coping well. When I say it was Mm -hmm. hearing just parents' reactions to their, it was just horrific and I wasn't coping well. And I figured out the way I cope. (laughs) It is two things. Number one is by making it completely about the family. So when I focused on myself, oh my gosh, I'm feeling this way and this. I don't cope well. When I make it completely about the family, I cope way better. It's like, okay, I can't control what's happening, but I can control on or focus on how I can make the situation a little better. 
you know, absolute huge thing. Yes, in the in the moment, just like we do in healthcare, right? We're just very focused on our patient, and that's how we shut off our own feelings. But there's a time when you go home, and part of the day sticks with you. It might even be right after the family leaves. And there are cases where I need to take a deep breath after I've talked to some of my patients, and it is like, whew. Um, that's yeah, I see it every day. So, I mean, what do you do? I I mean, self care is huge. Also, just focusing on what is in my control. I- I can't change the situation, but I can try and help in avoiding putting myself in their shoes. Like, oh my gosh, it must be so hard to be. I can't imagine what that'd be like. I try and really avoid that. And I try and focus on how can I help them? How can I make this just a tiny bit better when it's a horrific, traumatic situation? Mm -hmm. That's great advice. That's great advice. It's it's very dangerous past when we try to put ourselves in those shoes, then we can't help. And then we're kind of paralyzed. So absolutely. Good advice. You know, paint the scene. You're in a hospital and your kid's going to have to stay overnight because they have an infection, maybe osteomyelitis or cellulitis, you know, skin infection. I had a friend that had um, osteo of his heel and they were admitted for a long time and no one knew what caused it. And they had a newborn baby that was like Mm -hmm. a month or two old. Thankfully, I was working, so I was going to go visit them quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But um, what do you do in that scenario? How do you get the support? How old was the little one? Oh, two. A toddler. Yeah. Toddlers with hospitalization is a tough one, I will say, just mm-hmm. because they're so big on like routine and consistency and you're throwing them out of their routine in an unfamiliar environment. So it makes it really tough. Yeah. But I think one of the one of the biggest tips I have for like a toddler in the hospital is any little part of the routine you can try and keep, do it. So if you read a book to your child every night, if you're able to do it in the hospital or if a loved one's able to visit and you can FaceTime and still read that book, anything you can do to try and keep consistency is huge. Yeah. Uh, you can ask the hospital. Not every hospital has child life or sometimes they just do certain departments, but you can ask, is a child life specialist available or are they able to come by? Because they can absolutely work with your kid at their developmental level, help play things out, help your child understand why they're at the hospital. Mm-hmm. And just reiterating to your child, there's nothing you did to cause this, just to avoid any misconceptions, helping your child understand your body's sick and we're here to help get it better. Any procedures where I know it's no fun validating their feelings. I know it's no fun, but we do have to do this to help your body get better. And offering appropriate choices. Toddlers with choices is just the best thing ever. They yeah. will be way better. Oh. So during the poke, do you want to watch this video on the iPad or do you want to hug your stuffed animal really, really tight? Or should we just offering choices gives back a sense of control when they're so much out of their control. They're in this confined crib. They don't understand why they're there. They're scared. Mm-hmm. They're struggling to cope and offering appropriate choices can make a huge difference for a toddler specifically. So you said ask your hospital. Okay. When do they ask? They ask in the ER. Do they ask the doctor? Do they ask the nurse? Do they ask the tech? Do they ask once they get to the room? <laughs> I know they, this is what we think of, right? Is this okay to yeah. ask? Because people are busy. I don't want to bother them. There's another trauma that just came in. When do they ask? Absolutely. So in the ER, I would say most pediatric ERs have child life. So in the ER, you your child's in the room. You're not in the waiting room anymore. You're in the room. I really recommend asking the nurse, is there a child life specialist available? Because they they are really good at finding us and getting us in that room when there's a procedure. Otherwise, with inpatient, you can ask your nurse. Typically, you can ask, like, is there a child specialist at this hospital? Because oftentimes they're able to put in a consult or they're able to just, like, contact child life, call them real quick and have them come. Even if there's not a procedure, child life specialists can do therapeutic activities. We Mm -hmm. help kids cope through play. We give parent tips. Honestly, I worked the NICU for a while and I would just spend an hour in a room with the parent, not even not even providing support for the infant, but providing support for the parent. So yeah. if you're struggling, if your child has like long-term hospitalization or you're just overwhelmed as a parent, you you can ask for child life just for support for you. You're like, I need, I need something. I need support. I need someone to talk to. I need someone who understands what's going on. I don't know how to handle this situation. I don't know how to cope with this because mm-hmm. I provide just as much coping support for parents as yeah. I do kids, you know? Well, so is- I just think, Giving yourself permission to ask for help is huge. You know what? This nurse is busy, but I'm just going to ask her. And if she says they're not available, at least I tried. Because I know if I ask for what I need, I'm going to cope better, which means my child will cope better. I think that's a huge thing. 100% agree with you. And to highlight, child life is not just for the children. It's for yes. 
And we would yeah. not of that normally. So absolutely. And parents need support in these times. So I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I know you just started YouTube. It's hard. Big Jen. <laughs> I'm working on it. Well, so if they can't be a part of your program, ideally, it'd be awesome if, if we can funnel people to your program. That's kind of a goal, right? So we can help everyone. But if they can't, what the sun is on my face. What other resources do they have? Where can they go? So I have my game changer checklist. It is um, if you go to like mommies littlehelpercom or if you just go to the link on my Instagram, um, it's mommies underscore little helper. Basically, this checklist includes everything that you need to bring to your doctor's appointment and how to prep your kid. So for instance, it, I always recommend bringing like a comfort item and something that's if you're able to not familiar with a child, like a new toy or something that's not super familiar so you can distract them during the procedure. So mm -hmm. it just helps you. It's just a great resource to help prepare your child for their upcoming doctor's visit that I think every parent should have. And it's like I said, it's free. You just download it. Otherwise, I try and put tips on my Instagram. Just there, there are so many child life tips that a child life specialist can implement, but also there's there's only so much a parent can do as they're not familiar with all the different things. They didn't go to school for it. So I try and really gear my content towards realistic tips that parents can actually implement yes. during medical encounters, during, I also provide just like general parenting tips to make parenting a little easier, um, yes. how to handle tantrums, how to handle just stressful situations. So feel free to check out like my Instagram or anything like that for additional Love it. <laughs> and maybe we can link it in the podcast, Your some of your downloads, just That's as long thing. as it goes to the right link that you want sort of funnel people. So let's do that. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all this knowledge and sort of like realization that this is the real thing. And we kind of need to make sure that we're on top of it as parents and as mm -hmm. healthcare providers, especially like if I could share your knowledge with every healthcare provider I run into, I would. I mean, it, it's just we're so rushed these days in healthcare and we're traumatized and we're burnt out. And some of this stuff gets missed, but it's the kids that are like such usually the light of the day. They're the, you know, the best patients. Oh, <laughs> they are. They are. Best. 